So um, we're here tonight to talk about iNaturalist. And this is both um, tailored to the absolute beginner, someone who has never used iNaturalist in their life, but also someone who, like me, has been using iNaturalist every day for the past couple years, um, or maybe even longer than that. Uh, with that being said, um, if you don't already have iNaturalist download on your phone or pull up on the computer or you don't have an account, um, if you want, it might be helpful to download that at this time um, and create an account. It's completely free. It's really easy. I think all you have to do is put in your name, your email, your username, and your set. Um, so if you want to do that, that'd be great. And then obviously, you can also come back and rewatch this recording um, if you want to download it at a later time. Um, but with that being said, I think we're going to get started. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is just a very basic question and understanding of what is iNaturalist. Um, I broke it down into three main categories, but basically iNaturalist is a, um, a online database where you can submit media, uh, photos, or audio, um, and specifically for photos based on uh, things like location and time of year, date, et cetera, um, the algorithm on this on this app can tell you what you're looking at. So if you post a picture of a red-tailed hawk and you don't know what it is, um, based on where you are located, so in Colorado, in Boulder, um, and then a time of year, at this time of year, iNaturalist can kind of piece those two things together, the computer brain that I don't quite understand, I don't know if I want to understand because it's a little scary what it can do, um, can piece all of it together and then tell you that what you're looking at is a red-tailed hawk. And then, What's cool is that I can do that for a lot more complicated organisms, things that um, I can't identify at a first glance the same way that I can with uh, a red-tailed hawk. Um, so iNaturalist, in its simplest, most basic form, there's these three main components that I want to really emphasize as we go through this presentation for the rest of the night. And that's the idea that it's crowdsourced, so anyone around the world um, can submit data, can submit media, audio, whatever, to this database. You don't have to have some fancy degree, you don't have to pay, you don't have to have any of that, all you have to do is have a camera and a, a way of taking a photo. Community science, same idea, and then it's data collection, because ultimately everything that you're submitting is going to eventually, hopefully, be used by scientists um, to track things like migration, to track things like endangered species, and all of that. All right, um, we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, again, another really basic thing that I want to make sure that is clear. Um, I want to kind of just make a distinction between eBird and iNaturalist um, because we're here with CFO, as ornithologist in the name, obviously we probably all love birds, we probably all like going out and seeing birds, um, and you guys are probably all familiar with eBird. Um, and there are some important differences between eBird and iNaturalist that I also really quickly wanted to go over. Um, the first thing Probably the biggest distinction, in my opinion, is that iNaturalist observations uh, require uh, corroboration by someone else in order for it to be accepted. So what that means is that when you upload a photo initially um, and you put it into the database, it's not automatically accepted and able to be used for research. Um, it first must be uh, identified by someone else, and you're, what you put in, so you put in a red-tailed hawk, must also be accepted as a red-tailed hawk by someone else. Um, whereas in eBird, unless you're looking at a rare bird, something like a Barrow's gold knife, for example, in Lafayette, Colorado, which is an unusual rare bird here at, um, for now, but um, things like white town sparrows, spotted toes, uh, house sparrows, birds that are really common, all the feeders around here, those are automatically accepted into eBird. Even if for some reason you identify one of them wrong, that wouldn't necessarily be um, not accepted by eBird. Whereas on iNaturalist, you can't have your data accepted until it's been corroborated by someone else saying, oh, you saw white those you saw white those sparrows, not really common, white crown sparrow, um, and then someone else has to come in and, and agree and say, yes, this is a white crown sparrow. Similarly, there's also no checklist on my naturalist. That's a huge feature of eBird. You go out, make an observation, a, a list of observations of everything you saw that day. There's nothing like that on my naturalist. You can upload a bunch of observations from one day, but they won't all be grouped in a singular checklist the way that it is on eBird. Um, checklists on eBird can be conveniently shared with others. Um, if you do go out on a field trip, go on a field workshop with CFO or something, um, observations can't be shared like that in iNaturalist. Everyone has to either upload their own thing or only someone uploads one picture of it. Um, 
And then I guess this is maybe the biggest distinction between iNaturalist and eBird is that eBird is only for birds. iNaturalist um, involves birds, of course, but it also involves plants and fungi and uh, frogs and reptiles and all kinds of things, um, dead things, not necessarily living things. And we'll get into all that um, like in a couple slides. Okay. So now we are going to move in a little bit more to the nitty gritty side of this presentation. But first we are going to talk about literally navigating iNaturalist from the app and then also uh, from the website. So if you have it up on your phone, and again, if you don't have it on your phone, you can always come back to this presentation, revisit it, we're recording it. But this is what you see when you open up the app in the first place. Um, and I wanna draw your attention to the red box at the bottom. That's kind of your, home bar where you can explore everything, use everything that's what you use to navigate between different tabs in iNaturalist. Um, this is what my iNaturalist looks like from my phone. You can see all of my most recent observations um, as of when this presentation was made a couple days ago. Um, and then if you kind of toggle with the um, little icons at the bottom, um, you'll get to some different slides. So on the far left of your screen, those that's like the activity. So that's uh, you're going to see their comments that people have left if they have agreed with your identification, um, left comments, etc. Um, very basic, just interactions with other people. Um, in the middle of the screen, that's what it looks like when you click on that uh, camera icon in the center, um, and that's how you observe and upload uh, media to the iNatural phone app. Um, and you can take photos directly, or you can upload uh, photos you've already taken. And then in the far right side of the screen. Um, those are, the, that's the projects tab, and we'll get into projects later. I know there's a lot of information to be, that's being thrown at you right now, but um, we'll talk about projects uh, in a little bit. But I just wanted to make sure that you knew how to navigate the iNaturalist app um, from the home screen on the phone. Okay. Um, okay, then navigating iNaturalist from the web, which I prefer. Um, I know a lot of people use iNaturalist from the phone, and I definitely do it sometimes. I take the majority of my photos with my camera, so it's more convenient for me to upload my stuff, my photos um, from my computer to the app or to the website on iNaturals on my computer. Um, and I also find that the general layout of the web-based version is a little bit neater and easier to navigate. But um, the red box is your main, kind of the same idea of that bar that we saw in the, in the phone app. This is your main way of navigating through your own stuff. Um, here you can see, you can back to on observations, you can see all the photos, all the audio you've recorded, um, everything um, at this time, I guess January 14th, which was a couple of days ago. Um, you can, I had 5,400 observations about, and then you can see the number of species, and you can click on those and explore them a little bit more. Um, but that's the main, the main area that you're going to want to look at when you are navigating it from the web. Okay, moving on. The big thing that I also wanted to emphasize was that there are really two pillars to iNaturalist, two central pillars to, um, to understanding how this app works and um, being able to navigate it successfully. Um, the first one that we're going to talk about is observation, and then we'll dive into identification. Um, after that. But first, we are going to talk about um, observation. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit, but basically one of the main things that people use on Ashworth for is to upload media such as photos or uh, audio recordings like of birds or something, insect calls even, um, and then they upload that to the database and uh, it's identified for them, corroborated by other people, and then it can ultimately be used for a scientific purposes and research in the future. So the purpose of this part of the presentation is I'm going to briefly show you how to um, upload uh, things to iNaturalist and definitely use this as a guide, but I think the best way to learn this is to go out in the field. Obviously it's dark right now, it's nighttime, so that's not going to be super easy, but in the future, um, maybe even tomorrow morning or in the next few days when it warms up a little bit, definitely go outside and just mess around with the app if you're unfamiliar with it and if you're new to it, I think that's the best way to learn. Um, and I'll do my best to lay out the uh, kind of ground framework um, in the next, within the next few slides. So first we're gonna go over what um, this looks like when you're uploading 
um, an observation from your phone. Um, and I've chosen flower for this um, example. And I want to mention that this is from the WFO CFO joint convention uh, from this past July in Copper Mountain. Um, pretty aesthetic photographable flowers are a little bit hard to come by right now, especially since it was um, quite cold the last few days, a little bit below zero, quite a bit below zero for the last few days. So I am borrowing some screen captures from um, past uh, past warmer, sunnier days while I dream about that. Um, but anyways, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to select your photos that you want to upload. Um, or if you only have one photo, in this example, I have, I think, four photos that I was using to upload. Um, and then you'll pull up the screen that you see on the left side um, of your computer screen right now. Um, and you can see that there's a couple fields that we're filled in. So you can see that the location, Copper Mountain, Frisco, Colorado, and then also the date um, and the time. Um, sometimes you have to manually put that in. For me, on my phone, I have all my photos automatically sync with the location um, and the time. So that I don't have, I can bypass that step, and the uh, phone automatically knows uh, where the photo was taken. Um, anyways, I'm trying to click this. Okay, so then the uh, you're gonna want to make sure that your location, as I mentioned, is um, all good and right. For me, I think I had to zoom in a little bit on the precise place I was. Sometimes, if you're looking at a more sensitive species, the same way in eBird that you can sometimes kind of like cloud a location or make it um, private. Um, on on naturalist, if you are observing a rare or endangered organism, sometimes people do ask you to zoom out or if you're looking at it, um, if you're making an observation at someone's house, again, kind of, um, you might wanna consider zooming out and making location a little bit broader. Um, location is um, central though to the, a, a proper and uh, accurate observation, the same way that time of year and even time of day can be really important, but it's really time of year and location that are really essential that you make sure you include those um, when you are uploading uh, media to the uh, app. Um, because they use those, the, when I say they, the algorithm on iNaturalist uh, uses those two factors um, to sort through the many possibilities of what you're seeing and then ultimately narrow it down um, to a species. Um, so you can see here that uh, based on the location that I have there as well as the time um, of year that I naturalist suggested that I was seeing this type of plant or this type of flower um, and I'm not a botanist by any means. I definitely appreciate plants when I break them but I am not Great at identifying them, so I, I use iNaturalist a lot for plants, especially on my phone, um, to learn about what I'm seeing. So again, the main idea is that you need to have location and time um, to have a successful observation. Those two things are really crucial for any observation. And I guess my next slide, I guess. So again, just hammering in the idea that location and date should be inputted prior to you trying to um, use a suggested ID that we saw with the last slide kind of here, when you click on this where my arrow is moving, um, it's crucial that you put in those two factors in order for iNaturalist to be the most accurate in um, telling you what you're seeing. Okay, so now that was with the phone. Um, again, I don't use that as often just because I do take most of my photos with my um, digital camera, but um, that is certainly a popular way of uploading media and it's also very convenient, especially if you're out in the field and you have a burning desire to know what you're looking at at right that moment, then you can literally pull up the app in the field and it will work. Um, however, for the most part, I and I do use um, the web-based version, which we're going to go over um, right now as well. So you saw the screen a little bit earlier when I was uh, going over how to navigate the home page. Um, so I want to draw your attention again to the red box in the top corner. And um, uh, that is the upload button, so you self explanatory. You'll click on that in order to select the photos that you want to upload to iNaturalist um, from your computer. And then when you click on that button, your photos will show up like they do in this example. Um, this was from the morning, I think, when the first cold snap hit a couple days ago. I think it was like negative like 10 or negative 12 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe right outside my house, and um, there were still birds out. So 
that was pretty cool. I did not last very long. I was probably out there for maybe 30 minutes and I decided I had to go home and get a cup of hot chocolate or something. But um, I did see a couple of birds that morning and I wanted to use them uh, to explain uh, how to upload from the computer. Anyways, um, one kind of, I don't know if I would call it trick, but maybe just uh, practice I have picked up on um, in the past few years of using this app is selecting this select all box when you're uploading observations. Um, and this is only for when all of your photos uh, slash media are all from the same location. Um, in this case, they were both uh, right near the, there's some local bird feeders, uh, just a couple of minutes from my house um, at Wanaka Lake. Um, and so when you click, when you click the select all button, um, that enables you to apply the location that you um, observed for all of your species to the same species instead of having to go in for every single photo you have um, and manually put the location in here you can just do a little bit of a broader uh, circle of where you were but it it also saves off some time of having to um, put in a location so that's the big thing i think would be to mention from um from the, using this on the computer anyways you'll also see on the left hand of your screen um, on this slide that i've circled this kind of field with a bunch of different tabs. We're only going to focus on the top tab on details. Um, some of the other tabs we'll talk about actually at, uh, towards the end of this presentation, but not right now. So stay tuned for that. Um, but anyways, I think the next, yes, okay. I can't always see what my slide is next, so I have to make sure that I know what's coming next. Anyways, you can see in both of my observations here that I have the location and the time already, so I'm halfway there, so, uh, or not the location, I have the date and time um, there, so I'm halfway there, all I need is the location. Um, and again, my camera, I don't know how, but it automatically uh, puts in the location or the time and date for me when um, I am taking photos, so I don't have to do that, but if your camera doesn't do that, it's very important that you put in the correct time um, that you observed your thing. Um, and then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to click on the location. And I'm sure some cameras these days are fancy enough to know what, where you are, but my camera's a couple years old, so uh, it doesn't quite have that quality yet, but that's okay. Um, anyways, next you're going to click on the location button, and you'll see that here you can, where I'm putting my arrow, um, you can uh, type in where you were. Um, so this is the general vicinity of where I was, um, both those birds weren't right next to each other. So I did a little bit of a broader bubble. I was right by Greenlee, right by the feeders um, that are right there in front of the marsh. Um, so I did that bit of a broader location. Um, and then when you have your location in, when you have all of that information in, then you can, I can't see through the camera right here, but you can hit submit um, in the top corner and then uh, you will have your observation up. Um, and then obviously I neglected to mention this, but once you have those two in, um, the computer can then come in and um, once you click on species name, it will tell you what it is the same way that it did with the phone app. Um, very similar, just like very similar idea, just a little bit different layout. Um, and again, I find the, the web-based version to be a little bit more user-friendly. Okay, um, so that was kind of a light and fast uh, way of <clears throat> going over how to both navigate the iNaturalist app from the both the phone and the web-based version, as well as uploading media from the phone and the computer. So now we are going to move on to um, kind of iNaturalist features and practices and things I want to draw your attention to. Okay, so <clears throat> We're going to continue with the whole idea of observation. So we're still not, we're still in the first pillar. <clears throat> and then we'll move on to identification um, after that. So once you have your location and your date and time, et cetera, all that in, there's a couple of different things that can happen when you um, click species name to see to see what the computer thinks you're seeing, um, what you're observing, what you've photographed. Um, the first case, let's the map again. The first case. Um, is what I see as the best case. And as you'll see in a couple minutes, there's technically two best cases, but this is the first best case. Um, so it, in this scenario, you put in your location, which was uh, Greenlee again, and you put in the time, I think this was January 13th, um, and then you click on species name. 
And I'm a birder. I know most of the common birds, if not all of them, around in the area. So I knew that when I was photographing this bird that it was a red-tailed hawk. Um, so I, even before I put that in, even before I, the algorithm told me that this was a red-tailed hawk, I knew that what I thought was a red-tailed hawk. And you can see that the top option that it gives me is a red-tailed hawk. So I feel pretty confident that what I saw was a red-tailed hawk, and I can be sure that what I'm seeing is correct. Um, and so this is kind of the best case when you know what you saw when you, uh, in the field, when you observed an organism and for whatever reason you knew what it was and then iNaturalist uh, agreed with you. That's the best case in my opinion. Second best case, however, is um, this is, I think from a couple of days after that, this was yesterday, two days ago, I don't even remember. Um, but my dad and I went uh, out to Boulder Creek uh, in, again, sub-freezing temperatures. <laughs> Um, and there was an American Dipper that was um, very happy in the freezing cold water while we were bundled up on the side in many, many layers. Um, and he was looking uh, for food and whatnot in the freezing stream. But I, I digress. Um, the more important part of um, this slide is that another <clears throat> uh, case that can happen, I guess, when you are uploading media um, is that the algorithm only spits you back one option. So here you can see that its top suggestion is American Dipper. And then if you remember from the last slide, there was like five or six different possibilities, probably all videos that um, uh, it is suggested. Um, however, here it only suggests one. And again, I knew this was an American Dipper when I was observing in the field, but if I didn't know that this was an American Dipper, and iNaturalist only provided one option, then I would feel more confident in um, the op in the um, suggested identification that iNaturalist gave to me. Um, but again, with this one, it's not the best example because I did know what the difference was when I was looking at it in the field. Um, but yeah, this is just uh, the main takeaway from this slide is that um, when iNaturalist only gives you one, op one option, um, one identification, you can usually be pretty confident that what it's giving you is um, is correct. Okay, so those are the two happy best cases. I think we're gonna move on to not sad, but um, not as sure, not being as sure um, in your identification. So um, I had to search high and low for a good photographable plant on that day that we went to go to the dipper um, because everything was covered in a couple inches of snow and it's also winter, so a lot of plants are not out right now. But we did end up finding some uh, duckweed, which albeit it was, I think, probably frozen solid under a, a thick sheet of ice, but it was still plant and it was still out. Um, so I, like I mentioned earlier, and by no means, I'm not a botanist. Um, I appreciate the plants. I can identify some of them, but I'm not an expert. Um, and with this case, um, to me, all of the options it gives me, you can see it gives me four options, common duckweed, least duckweed, greater duckweed, and the water lily aphid, which I, that, I think that's an insect. So I don't, or a, yeah, I don't even know what that is. But anyways, um, this, uh, to me, they all look the same, at least the first review, the duckweed, the common least and grape duckweed. Um, and I can't be sure what that is. Um, so a general tip is that when you don't know um, what exactly you're looking at, um, for example, with a duckweed, it could also be with another plant or even a bird. Um, always stick with the broader ID or taxon. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is a duckweed, so I can at least put in the genus um, Lemna for this, for duckweed. And then I'm confident that later someone, maybe the world's foremost expert in duckweed biology or identification or something, will be able to come in and further narrow down like, oh, this you were seeing a common duckweed or you were seeing a least duckweed or whatever, um, because I certainly do not have um, that identification uh, uh, capability in my in my toolbox. So when in doubt, if you don't know exactly what you saw, it's always best to stick with the broader taxon because ultimately there's probably someone out there on iNaturals who knows more about this than you do and can come in and uh, help you identify this if, if you really want to know. Okay, scenario number four, this sort of, throw out a uh, disclaimer, this is not from recent, this is from the CFO-WFO uh, joint convention this past summer in July. Um, and this is the fourth scenario of when you are uploading media. And this is when you have to go super duper broad um, with your observation. 
So here, if you recall from the last few slides, um, iNaturals had always given us uh, a, I can go back to this last slide, uh, we're pretty sure it's in this genus or within, within this family or something. Here in this mushroom observation, it didn't even give us that. And it even left a little note, we're not confident enough to make a recommendation. So you're like, uh oh, well, if they don't know, then I don't know. <laughs> um, so with that, um, my usual, uh, I guess, technique with this kind of situation is um, I, again, I can't speak out with the camera, um, I will go super broad. Um, and so I know that this, I, I at least know that this is it, a type of fungi in, in, in the kingdom, it's fungi including lichen. And I know that's super duper broad, but I know that's right. Um, and then ultimately after that, um, again, an expert can come in and help me further narrow it down, or I can um, actually tag someone, which we will go on, uh, we'll, we will uh, talk about that in a little bit. But um, if you both, you don't know what you're looking at, and iNaturalist also doesn't know what you're looking at, it's best to go super broad. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go all the way to the kingdom, you could go to the phylum or the family or whatever. Um, but if, if it's not giving you, you can see here that it's giving me a, a couple different genera, and then um, also there's just no um, overarching genus or family that it provides. So because of that, I decided to go super broad and went all the way to the kingdom um, taxon for this observation. Okay, I believe after this, okay. Um, so yes, ooh, why is it going that way? We're going too far ahead. Okay, anyways, um, again, we went over this, but um, once you finally have your observations in based on what iNaturalist suggested, and again, I want to emphasize that this, all these three observations, the red-tailed hawk, white trunk sparrow, the duckweed, um, those three identifications were made entirely by the algorithm on iNatural. So I didn't type in any of that. They literally used both my photo as well as the location and the time of year that I uploaded these photos. Um, and then they were able to um, tell me what I was looking at, which is really, really cool in my opinion. Um, and then after you have all of that up um, with your with your time, your location, your identification, everything, and you can click the submit button in the top right corner, and your photos are now on the database, waiting to be um, hopefully identified and then eventually accepted into everything. Okay, that is observations. Now we're going to move on to the second pillar, um, really broad pillar of iNaturalist, which is um, the idea of uh, identification. Um, and I wanted to put a little disclaimer that it is also um, pretty inconvenient. I don't even know if it's possible. I've never seen a but an option on the app uh, to do identifications from the mobile app. Um, and when I say identification, um, I mean that obviously we just talked about the whole idea of observing photos, so or observing media and then uploading those photos to iNaturalist. <clears throat> and in order for those photos to be accepted into the database, there has to be people that are identifying those photos. So the idea of identification is that there's a whole other side to iNaturalist that consists of people who are identifying all of the, or not all of the media, but a lot of the media that is coming in. Um, and then also to be clear, it's not one or the other, you can do both. So like I do both observations and identifications on iNaturalist. Um, and there's certainly people who only do observations. You're not obligated to do identifications by any means, but of course it's also, uh, it's really helpful uh, to everyone in general. <clears throat> okay, so I'm first gonna talk about how to navigate to the identify tab from the home screen. So again, we are returning to the home screen of um, the web-based version and then again, I don't think there's a way to identify from your phone. Um, and if there is, I have never found it. So it's probably really hard to find and probably really inconvenient. <laughs> um, but anyway, I recommend identification from the computer. So you can see again my home screen and then the red box in the top. Um, and that's where you click on to identify stuff. Okay, so when you click on that button, um, you'll pull up this kind of generic tab and if you, click reload like every second there's like 10 new images that comes in just that's the amount of people that are observing stuff every second 
like on iNaturals, which is crazy. Uh, it's all obviously from all around the world, all different kinds of tax. So you can see here, there's a huge variety of stuff um, already. For me, that can be really overwhelming. And also I am most comfortable with identifying um, organisms, especially birds from the United States. Um, that's what I'm most familiar with. So you can filter out the um, kinds of photos and media that you're seeing um, and that you will ultimately be identifying. So if you click on the filters button, um, this rather complicated uh, screen will show up. And here you can kind of mess around with it. Um, you can take picture, you can do identifications with only photos, with only sounds. You can do uh, ones that have been tagged as uh, captive species. You can mess with the, you can uh, mess with the kind of specific kind of organism you're looking at. Maybe you only want to do birds, which is honestly what I mostly do. That's what I'm most comfortable with identifying. You could do only mushrooms. Again, there's so many people on iNaturalist that are experts at so many different kinds of ecology that I've met some really, really cool scientists on here who are really, really good at identifying really specific organisms. And that's kind of the beauty of iNaturalist. You can upload these things and chances are there's probably someone on iNaturalist that is an expert for whatever reason on that species or on uh, that particular habitat or something. Um, so in this example, I put in birds and um, Colorado uh, for identifying. And then you can see that automatically all the photos all of a sudden don't look as warm and sunny as the photos that we saw on the previous slide um, because it has snowed and it's been quite cold for the last few days. But the birds are still out, people are still out and observing, which is great. Um, okay, so again, you can mess around with all kinds of stuff. You can you can go broad, you can get the United States instead of Colorado, you can do the whole world, whatever. Just mess around with that. And then I usually do birds um, in the US or Colorado. And so with that being said, how do we actually identify anything on a naturalist? Um, so if you see, one thing I will mention um, on that I I think you get more used to it as you get on the app for a longer time is that higher quality photos are always um, easier for identifiers, obviously, to be able to corroborate. Um, and they also uh, don't flood the database with photos that will ultimately never be used because they are of such poor quality that it's basically impossible to identify them um, for sure. So. Uh, higher quality photos are always appreciated, but obviously um, there's no, there's not really any quality control for that on iNaturalist. So um, that's something I guess that uh, is interesting. But anyways, uh, to actually identify, I think I did wild turkey. Yes, I did. Okay, so for what you're gonna do, um, again, going back to the slide, we can see wild turkey there, and then you're going to click on that um, uh, picture and I couldn't necessarily tell that it was a wild turkey from that photo that was on the previous slide. Uh, it was kind of small, dark, et cetera. Um, and then when you click on this, um, you can also zoom in on the photo. You can move it around, that kind of stuff. And I can tell this is clearly a wild turkey. So you can notice that in the top here, it, there's a yellow flag that says it needs ID. So that means that this photo has not yet been identified or corroborated, corroborated by um, another individual. So at this point, it hasn't been accepted um, formally into the database. It's still kind of waiting for that uh, for that uh, identification that it needs. Um, so I know that this is a wild turkey. I know that what this person said it was um, is correct. So I went ahead and clicked the agree button that you can see um, that I circled in red at the bottom of the screen. And then if we go to the next slide, you can see that my name is now down there. Um, and I also put in wild turkey. And then the most important thing about this slide is that the yellow flag that originally said needs ID on the last slide now is green, beautiful, and it says research grade. So when an observation has reached research grade status, that means that it has now been formally accepted into the database and is now visible on the various maps and whatnot um, on, uh, on iNaturalist. Um, and this happens all the time with all different kinds of organisms, all different kinds of photos. Okay, I do not remember my one. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, that was identification. Again, this is something that you just kind of mess around with on the app and or on the web-based version, and you just learn how to 
um, how to use it best. Um, I have a lot of fun doing identifications. I also think that it's a great way to learn more about bird ID. Um, I'm very careful as I, most people should be with making identifications because these are ultimately accepted and you don't want to make an incorrect identification. Um, but I find it really a great learning experience when I have my um, Sibley guide or maybe I should promote my dad's bird book is out in front of me, my Colorado, my Birds of Colorado book out in front of me, um, whatever I have. And I'm actively looking at uh, different uh, feathers and different uh, flight shots and whatnot, um, trying to understand and make sure that what I'm seeing uh, is correct. And then one thing that I also want to mention here is that um, if you put in the wrong identification, if you identify your photo, say someone said this was a, a scaled quail, I don't know, they're kind of similar by shape, obviously much smaller. But um, the nice thing about I'm naturalist is that um, if you put something in wrong, someone can come in and disagree with what you're saying. So they can come in and be like, oh, that's, this is not a scaled quail, this is actually a, a wild turkey. And um, because of that, then your observation will not be accepted. And then I think after that, it needs uh, three people. So that you yourself included needs three people to agree um, that this is the, that what you put in initially was wrong and that here's a new identification. Um, and that's a really great way to make sure that everything, all the photos and everything that's going into the database is correctly identified um, and can be used for accurate data collection. So again, um, Putting in the wrong identification doesn't necessarily doesn't most of the time doesn't necessarily mean that um, it will be accepted as a wrong photo because someone will probably catch it and then they will disagree with your initial identification and then uh, other people will come in and either agree with you or will be back and forth or whatever. And sometimes a final species is never settled on and it kind of sits at a family or a genus level and that's okay. <laughs> But yeah, it's, that's one of the things I love about iNaturalist is that um, there's a level of uh, commitment to accuracy um, here just because of the nature that you need um, agreement um, among different people to make sure that what you're seeing, um, that what you observed, what you put in as this identification is actually what you observed. Okay, um, now we are moving on to kind of the final portion of the presentation. Uh, this part, I included um, 10 I, best practices, features, I kind of struggled with what to call this slide, um, of, of iNaturalist in general. So I'm thinking not necessarily about things that you uh, do on the app, but also just things to keep in mind when you're using iNaturalist, um, and some different kinds of uh, features that I've picked up upon on the last few years that I have been messing around and exploring iNaturalist. And I wanted to share that with you um, because I find that these are really important uh, for, for using this app and making the most of everything that it has to offer. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about is research grade. And we just went quite in depth um, about that. And again, as I said earlier, um, this is probably one of uh, my favorite features of iNaturalist, just the, the nature of um, how committed they are to making sure that everything that's being accepted into the database is correctly identified. So here I present again uh, the white crowned sparrow and the familiar duckweed that we spent a little bit of time talking about in the beginning of the presentation. And you can see that they both have that yellow needs ID flag. So that means that so far I'm the only person that has come in and said, oh, this is a white crowned sparrow and this is duckweed because these are my photos. At this point from these photos when they were taken, no one had corroborated what I had seen and they had not been accepted into the database. Um, however, uh, with the white crown sparrow, uh, within a couple minutes, so you could see at the time of this photo, about seven minutes after I uploaded to the database, someone, I actually know this person, um, came in and uh, corroborated what I saw, and then it reached research grade distinction. So again, that means that it was ultimately accepted to the database. Um, and uh, it can be used now by scientists around the world who are studying white crown sparrows for whatever reason. Um, another thing that I didn't really mention is that when something has been uh, accepted or agreed upon by another person, other people can still come in and identify it. So 
Um, and also, honestly, if the more people that come and identify it, the more sure you are of what you're observing is correct. Um, and the identification that you put in is right. So you can see here that um, my white crown sparrow reads research grade distinction. However, um, for the duckweeds, and I think still to, to, to today, I think I checked on this earlier, my duckweed unfortunately still has not been identified to species. So I still have no idea if this is, I don't even remember the greater, least something duckweed uh, or common, I can't remember, but I still don't know what exactly I saw. I know I saw duckweed, but I don't know what kind of species I saw. Um, so hopefully this gets resolved in the next few days, because I would be curious to know. Um, but you can see that it still has the needs ID, the yellow flag, so that means that it has not been formally accepted into the database, and my photo slash my observations cannot be used by scientists setting, or someone, someone who's interested in duckweed, I don't know. Um, another thing that, there's a, so we talked about the two flags, the yellow flag and the green flag. Um, the final one I want to talk about that we hadn't seen yet is the gray flag, I guess. Um, this is the idea of a casual observation. Um, so what casual basically means, um, these are, it can mean a variety of things, but usually in my experience, um, observations have a casual distinction when they are of uh, usually mammals, but also sometimes cultivated plants that aren't necessarily indigenous to an area or are introduced or uh, or things like domestic cats, or you can upload humans on a naturalist. I don't know if that's the best idea, <laughs> um, but because they're not necessarily wild, um, they'll have a casual distinction. And um, for this example, this, again, not from any time recently, I wish I had seen a bison in the last few days, but that's not the case. Um, I think this was from 2021. Yeah, that's what it says on there. But anyway, this was at a ranch down in south, southwestern slash south central Colorado. Uh, near the sand dunes and this bison population there uh, at this ranch is like maintained um, they're vaccinated they are closely watched by the uh, the people that manage it so because of that um, this observation uh, has a casual distinction because it's not technically wild um, and for that reason it will never really be able to get rid of that distinction um, whereas you can see here that it says casual observations can also be missing location or a date. Um, so again, that kind of hammers in on the real importance of including your location and your date, and then also actually attaching a photo or an audio recording to iNaturalist. Um, so if you have a casual distinction, definitely um, make sure that you have submitted all the correct information um, and that you have everything. And then if not, that could also just mean that you're observing either a cultivated plant um, or uh, an introduced species for whatever reason. For example, a lot of um, some people that I've talked to use iNaturalist as gardeners, um, and a lot of plants that people plant in their yards if they're not indigenous um, to the area will not be accepted into a database ultimately. Okay, moving right along. Um, the next uh, tip that I wanna talk about is the importance of uploading multiple photos um, of the same organism. Um, so here in this example, you can see there was a white crown sparrow that I uploaded three photos in total. Um, different, I think they're all the same bird. They should all be the same bird because they're on the same observation. Um, but I have uploaded three different uh, pictures. And for birds, um, usually if it's a good photo, they're pretty distinctive, um, especially at the feeders when they're common birds like this. Um, but it's always good to have multiple photos if, if necessary. Um, and this is especially, not just for birds, but especially important in my opinion for plants and fungi. Um, unlike birds, most birds, in most cases, um, a lot of times plants, especially trees, uh, other, like just plants in general for the most part, um, you definitely need multiple photos in order to be able to accurately and for sure know what you're looking at. Um, this is another example from the CFO WFO Joint Convention that I uploaded slash took these photos when I was up there at Cobham Mountain. And you can see the importance of this in the next, in this slide here. So something that I have learned while being on a natural for the past couple of years um, is that a lot of times with trees, especially pine trees, which I'm still learning how to identify um, correctly, a lot of times a simple look at a pine cone or a picture of one part of the tree is not sufficient, is not enough for you to, for someone to come in and be able to tell you what you're looking at. 
a lot of times we need pictures of individual cones. Sometimes we need pictures of the pine needles. A lot of times the general height slash shape of the tree is really important. Sometimes you need a picture a little bit farther out of some clusters of pine needles. Um, this is also true with smaller plants like flowers. Often, oftentimes um, just the flowering part, just the bud is not enough. Sometimes you need to see the stem and the leaves and how they're all connected. Oftentimes a picture with your hand in it to be able to kind of size gauge what you're looking at on the on the iNaturalist is really important too. So in general, I always advise to add more than one photo to an observation. Not only um, does it help uh, identifiers, but it also um, makes it, it, I feel like it also teaches you more if you know more about the plant um, uh, to, to begin with. Okay, um, number three, um, I talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but I had did not mention at all how this is possible, was the idea of tagging experts and meeting other, natural, uh, other naturalists. Um, one of the things that I love about iNaturalist is how interactive it is um, and how many people that I've met through using um, this, this uh, database and website in general. Um, and a great example, a more practical example of this is that when I don't know what I'm looking at, I will almost always eventually tag someone um, who is uh, known or who has a lot of uh, identification for uh, this particular organism and you're probably wondering well how do you how do you do that so here you can tell that i tagged nick block who's a he's also a birder but he's really really good at identifying uh, butterflies especially um so here i knew it was a dusty wing but i didn't know exactly what species it was and i was pretty curious so um if you scroll down on the web on the page you can this is the same page these two slides are just more zoomed in you can see um here in the bottom corner that there is the top identifiers of the um at the time, it says Rocky Mountain Dusty Wing now because um, that's what it was identified at. But at first, it was top identifiers of just Dusty Wing. Um, and then here, it literally lists uh, the top, uh, what is it, 10 people that are known for identifying that organism. And then you can tag them just by saying at and then their username. Um, and then they'll get a comment or a notification in their inbox or whatever. And then they can come in and, and hopefully help you narrow down what you're looking at. Um, yeah, you can see that I tagged Nick Block. There's a bunch of other people that I also could have tagged, but I chose him because I know him. Um, okay, the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, going from broad to narrow identification. And we kind of talked about this a little bit with the mushroom, um, this idea, but uh, I think that sometimes there is the tendency to want to know what you're looking at right away. And I get that appeal. I definitely like that sometimes too. But um, it's also really important that you are being accurate um, with what you're with what you're posting and making sure that whatever you have there uh, is is all correct. Um, so here <clears throat> is an example from when I was at Pawnee um, last summer, and there was uh, after all that crazy, we had a very very wet spring um, last uh, a couple what almost a year ago, um, and Pawnee was flooded and all these places with a bunch of different pools of this like murky brown water that at first glance you're like there's nothing there you can't see anything there but if you sat there long enough you actually started to notice a lot of cool things and one of this was this uh what now i know is beaver tail fairy shrimp but this at the time i really only knew that it was some kind of fairy shrimp and even then i wasn't even positive that was correct so here you can see that my the identification that i put in um and i think that this was probably also suggested by the iNaturalist um algorithm was um, the family of this uh, shrimp. So it was in the family Thamnostephalidae. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, I put that in as a super broad identification. And to my luck, um, a couple of days later, um, someone else came in who knew what I was looking at and was able to narrow it down to a more specific um, identification. So definitely don't feel like you have to put in something right away to the correct species because um, chances are you might be wrong. And also the beauty of that a naturalist is that there are so many people out there that are willing to help you and excited to help you identify and narrow down what you're looking at. Um, okay, uh, the next example, this is kind of a little similar, um, but with this one, this was again, right near my house at Wanaka Lake um, with fish. There's a lot of fish there that I don't know what identifications of. 
And um, so on the left side of the screen, this is uh, the photo that I uploaded. And then on the right side of the screen, you can see there was actually quite a lot of dialogue that happened um, with this specific observation. So I initially put in race and fishes, very broad taxa. I didn't know what I was looking at. And then I kind of wrote a comment. I didn't know if these were two different species. To me, they were different, but I didn't know if they maybe were the same species, male and female. Um, and then you can see that I, um, after that, I tagged two people using the same uh, technique that I showed you in the last uh, example. Um, and the first person that responded was like, sorry, I don't know freshwater fish. I was like, you know what, that's cool. The next person, however, um, actually grew up right near um, where this observation was and he knew what I was looking at um, and then ended up leaving um, an identification and then also just some general kind of uh, identification tips and what I was looking at, which I thought was super cool. So not only is tagging people um, a great way to, in general, um, learn what you're looking at, it's also a great way to just like meet people and learn more about how to, how to identify someone from how to identify something from someone who really knows what they're talking about. Um, for example, with green sunfish, which I'm, I'm not a fish person, so I didn't know what I was looking at. Okay. And the red boxes, I just talked about that. Okay, we're halfway there. <laughs> the, or almost halfway there. But the fifth idea is utilizing projects. Um, and projects are essentially, they're a collaborative way of keeping track of organisms um, that you observe through either video, or not video, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, uh, through uh, photos or audio. And you can keep track of them within a certain time frame or a certain location, or you can do both. Um, and so if you navigate to the projects tab, I think that's, yeah. So if you go up to the community tab on your home screen, I circled in the very beginning of, of the project or of the presentation, we didn't, we didn't talk about that quite, that much, but there are a plethora of projects that you can join and be a part of. And what this means is that for all of your observations that you upload that fall within the general guidelines of this project, whether it's based on location or time, um, they will all automatically be pooled into that project. Um, so for an example, uh, a lot of every year, um, iNaturalist sponsors what they call the City Nature Challenge. And for, I think like four days and every April, the end of April, maybe early May, uh, citizens or people from all around the U.S., maybe even the world, um, definitely in the U.S. Uh, can come in and join the local city nature challenge for where they live. So for me, I always join the uh, Denver Metro one. I guess for next year, I will join, or this year, it's 2024 now, um, I will join one somewhere in New Jersey. And um, all of these photos that you upload during that time period will automatically be Kind of shepherd into this uh, into this project, and you can people from all over the region, all over that time frame, can all uh, participate and all contribute uh, media to that project. And it doesn't necessarily have that's only one example. There's a ton of different examples here. There's here are, here are just a few that I saw when I when I initially pulled up the projects tab. Um, there's some really random ones um, like bugs in flight. So my guess is that this would be only pictures of bugs that are flying, white shots, I guess. Um, there's also projects look like with UV fluorescent organisms, so I'm guessing different kinds of mushrooms and uh, scorpions probably that you can add these projects. And it's a super cool way of just organizing your, your media um, into, a, into a new way. Um, another example that some of my uh, friends that I've met through iNaturalist, a lot of them, if they have like a specific park or like a patch, they burn a lot. Sometimes they'll make a project just for that area so that they can keep track over the years of everything that they see in that area, which I think is a cool idea. Okay, moving right along. Okay, this is another example of a project that I neglected to mention. Um, this one that I think is really cool. Um, I'm part of the Young Naturalist Community Project on iNaturalist. And as you can see by the project description, it's for all iNat users who are under the age of 21. Um, and over the course of the three years this project has been a part of, um, we've observed more than 62,000 species, which I think is really cool. And that's only 344 people, all of them under the age of 20, all of them under the age of 21, and we've observed more than 60,000 species, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, okay, moving right along, the final, or not the final, we're getting close. Um, for the sixth 
tip that I have is it's really important that you upload species again and again and again, even if they're super common. Um, an example that I have uh, for a while, I don't think I am anymore, but for a while in the state of Colorado, I was the top observer of the American bullfrog. I don't think that's the case anymore, sadly, but I observed, I, up, I literally uploaded 60 photos of American bullfrogs. Like I think in a span of one summer, I like went through a bullfrog obsession. But uploading more and more photos of the same um, organism, the same species, um, just trains the algorithm to be better and better and better identifying things for the future. So the more you upload, the better it gets, the better it's for everyone. Um, okay, and then we talked a little bit about this with the distinction between eBird. Um, a naturalist is more than just living organisms. Um, and specifically with eBird, it's more than just birds, but a naturalist takes this step further and you can do stuff that aren't even living, living organisms, dead organisms, whatever. I'll give a couple examples in the next few slides though. Um, so the first thing that you can do is you can upload pictures of tracks. Um, this is from a greater prairie chicken lek that um, we stumbled upon uh, uh, back in, we were, I think we we're in Yuma County, yeah, I think so, um, in Colorado. And um, I was able to upload this as a greater, a greater prairie chicken observation, which was pretty cool. Um, and you can do this also with, uh, in, especially in the snow right now, if there's rabbit tracks or in the mountains, um, bears, moose, that kind of stuff, you can upload tracks and then we'll also go to the database and be accepted. Um, you can also upload like dens, like to take example of this with this wood rat. Um, you can upload things like prairie dog, burrows, um, nests, bird nests, for example, if you find um, an, a, like maybe after all the leaves have fallen off the trees and suddenly you find like, oh, this kind of bird was nesting in my front yard this summer and I never realized, you can upload a picture of the nest, um, which I think is really cool. Um, and some more examples, you can obviously upload feathers of birds um, and then you can also upload scat. Um, these are not my photos, these are from some uh, observations that I found on a naturalist. And then the final example of this really takes non living to or not living to the next to the next level, but you can upload dead organisms. This is from a walk that I took around campus towards the beginning of the year. Um, and unfortunately we found this mouse dead, but I was able to still get it identified and upload it uh, to the iNaturalist. So again, you can do dead organisms, you can upload tracks. Scat, uh, feathers, all that. And this is collectively known as like trace on my naturalist. And I think that my next slide, yes, talks a little bit about that. So if you go, pull this camera out of the way. Um, if you go to the uh, right, wrong way, um, to the right hand side of the observation, again, we're using the white tongue sparrow as our model for this particular slide. If you pull up the annotation slide, you can see here that there are um, some extra things that you can input in after you've uploaded your organism. Um, I, I tend to not do this because it's an extra step that's not necessary, but um, I, if I really wanted to, I could have selected that, yes, this organism was alive. The evidence of its presence was, um, I saw it there. It was, um, and this, the evidence of presence is more for things like feathers or scat. You, uh, it lets you select those kinds of options. Um, life stage, you know, this is an adult, and then um, also for things you can also select the sex of the organism if that is um, necessary. Again, I don't usually do this because it's not necessary for something to be tunneled into the um, database, but um, it is another thing that you can add to make your uh, observations a little bit more technical. Okay, um, the eighth thing we've, I've kind of mentioned Sometimes you, you can upload audio, you can upload uh, photos, but I didn't really specify, you know, I didn't really dive deep into the details of what that meant. Um, the main thing with iNaturalist is that the majority of the photos of the media that goes into the database are photos. Um, those are most convenient, obviously, with you know, the advent of uh, phones, iPhones, Samsungs, Androids, et cetera. It's very easy to just go outside and take a picture of something with your phone. And these days, phone cameras are incredibly good so it's even easier and more appealing to go out and take photos um, and everything that I've showed you so far has all been uh, photos that I've uploaded that being said you can also upload audio um, and I put a kind of there because we talked about the amazingness of and um, the iNaturalist uh, algorithm being able to tell you exactly what you're looking at based off of your photo 
unfortunately, it cannot do that for audio. So Merlin, if you're familiar with that, can you can stick your phone up when you hear a bird singing or whatever, um, and it can tell you what you're hearing. With iNaturalist, unfortunately, it doesn't do that. You have to manually type in um, what you're looking at, and hopefully that will be um, fixed in the future, or not necessarily fixed, hopefully that will be developed, um, and that iNaturalist will eventually be able to identify things by by audio and not just by not by um, visual photos. Um, so for me, the majority of the things I upload audio of is birds. And again, I usually know what I'm hearing based off of Merlin or just um, me knowing what I'm listening to. Um, so I can also upload that. But of course, if you hear something and you don't necessarily know what you're listening to, you can always tag an expert um, in birds and hopefully get that identified. And then as for video, um, there is no video capability of uploading uh, videos to iNaturalist. You can upload like GIFs to iNaturalist. I've never tried that. So you can have like a like a two second video basically, but just plays back and forth. Um, I have seen that a couple of times. It's very, in my experience, not widely used. Um, so again, there's unfortunately no video capability um, on iNaturalist. Okay, uh, the almost their final thing. Um, is about Seek, which I really wanted to just briefly uh, touch upon. Um, and this is kind of the uh, child, if you will, of iNaturalist. Um, and it follows the same uh, steps and idea of iNaturalist, whereas this is a, it's a phone-based app, by the way. There's no digital basis for this on the computer. Um, and so when you open up uh, the app, you'll see on the left-hand corner, there's a big camera button. Um, at the bottom and you click on that, you hold it up to usually a plant. I usually only use this as plant. Um, and then you can see in that red box in the center of the screen, it told me what I was looking at. Um, and then you can click the photo. And then because this is directly tied to iNaturalist, you can actually, uh, if you uh, tag, if you connect your seek to your iNaturalist, you can upload this photo with the identification directly to iNaturalist. Um, but seek is a, a great app if you're just looking for basic, usually plant identification in the field. If you just are out on a walk or you're on the mountains and you wanna know basically what you're looking at, um, this is a great way of doing that. You can just hold your phone up um, to a plant and it will tell you what it is. Um, okay, and then the final thing for tonight and the final kind of reason that I think you should use iNaturalist is that I think it's just really cool to participate in community science. Um, hopefully through this, you've seen that I've been able to interact with some really cool people that I've just met through iNaturalist. Um, some really cool scientists who are doing really interesting work, who are doing really unique um, work and helping me to learn more about um, ecology in general. And then I'm also able to share my expertise that I have um, in certain types of bird identification and, and whatnot um, with others. And I've just been able to meet such great communities and part of so many cool outings and field trips where we've used iNaturalist or we've uploaded photos to iNaturalist. These are just a couple photos that I have from over the years um, of just participating in big groups outside with nature. Um, and I don't know, I just, I hope that um, from this presentation, you took away some interesting things about iNaturalist that you're excited to use iNaturalist. Um, I know that CFO is planning um, within the next few months to hopefully do a couple of field workshops actually out in the field where we'll be using iNaturalist to actively um, learn how to do it and also upload photo, our own photos and audio um, to the site. Um, and so with that being said, I'm all done for tonight. Um, thank you so much to CFO and for Helen for introducing me um, tonight. And that is, that's all I have for tonight. So thank you again. Um, and at this time, I think I have one final slide for questions and answers. So if there's anything at this time, I would be happy to take any questions. But again, thank you so much for your for your attention and time tonight. Anna, thank you. That was a great, engaging, and detailed presentation. Um, it, for me, I definitely uh, greatly expanded my knowledge of what is possible with INAT. So thank you. Um, Hey, so let's um, go into some of the questions that showed up in the chat, um, if, if folks don't mind. And as, as Hannah mentioned too, we're gonna try to um, organize some field trips um, around iNaturalist um, coming in the spring, the summer. So we'll keep people informed on that. Okay, so first 
the question was, the first question was the use of C. Yeah, and so I think you kind of covered that, thank you. Um, Courtney was mentioning I preferred it since it gives me some immediacy in my signings, but I haven't taken the time to see what their connectivity is. And that's a great point about C is that it doesn't, it definitely has an element of immediacy to it where you can literally hold your phone up to it and it will tell you what you're looking at. And that kind of is like a, it comes with its pros and cons. If you don't have your location in, um, it could give you something completely wrong. I remember one time I was looking at a bull snake here and it looked a little weird to me. It was very darkly patterned and it was ultimately a bull snake. But when I put it into Seek, Seek said I was looking at some like Mexican species of bull snake that was only found, it was like endemic to a region of Mexico. So there definitely are some disadvantages to Seek um, and that I prefer iNaturals for. But it is true that there is a definite, definite uh, element of immediacy to getting an identification right away um, when you're using Seek. Okay. Um, Jack said, is your default um, is to agree with someone who provides an identification that differs from yours? Um, I think it depends. Uh, for me, if I see something that is um, immediately like catches my attention as something that is either different or incorrect, then yes, I will usually go in. But um, I don't... Uh, some people do like crazy amounts of identifications on a naturalist. I am not one of those people. Um, 20,000 might sound like a lot, but there are some people in there that have like probably close to a million identifications on a naturalist. So for me, I usually stick to things that I agree with um, just to be sure that what I'm doing is, is correct. Okay. Um, and uh, Courtney's other question, I, and I think you touched on this, does I now have a report sound option? Mm -hmm. If not, what platforms are recommended? Is there a convenient um, from phone format? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually recently, um, iNaturals now has the same way they have a built-in camera um, on the phone app. They also have a built-in record sound option. I find that I prefer to still use Merlin and then I upload that. I upload my recording from Merlin to iNaturals. Um, and I also find that voice memos on the iPhone, I don't know the equivalent of that for Android or Samsung, but I'm sure there's some similar recording app um, and that pipeline from that recording to iNaturals is also great but there is a record sound option on iNaturals now again it just doesn't tell you what you're looking at which is unfortunate. Um, okay and uh, Allison is asking do you recommend separating a trait photo from a photo of the organism if they are seen together? That is an excellent question. Um, no I guess it, it depends. I actually think of one very uh, specific um, example of this. This is not necessarily with Trace, this was with an audio recording that I took of an insect. Um, and I was able to also get a photo of the insect. Um, if you know that the trace you're seeing, um, for example, scat or uh, tracks are from the organism, then it definitely helps to include a photo of the actual organism if you're able to get it. Um, usually a photo of an organism, like a rabbit is, a at least in my um, in my uh, opinion and in my experience, is a lot easier to identify correctly um, than it is to just by, just by the nature of looking at tracks. And it also makes your observation, I think, seem a little bit more reliable. So definitely, if you're able to get a photo of both the individual organism as well as an element of its tracks, whether it be scat or uh, tracks or whatever, um, that that is definitely great. But yeah, that's a great question. Good to know. Um, and I think that is all the questions we have for now. Um, Hannah, I'm gonna let you have the last word here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, well, thank you again so much. Thank you for the questions. Um, as was mentioned, this recording is uh, up, will be uploaded and shared because it's been recorded. So you can definitely come back in, check if you have any questions. Um, you're also welcome to reach out to me. Um, if you have any questions about iNaturalist. And uh, thank you again. And I hope to see some of you guys out in the field using iNaturalist in the future. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, thanks everybody. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be uh, sending out the uh, recording to